If you have a Bible on your smartphone, whether it's you version uh, or a paper Bible, I want you to follow along. We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 23. Um, also, speaking of you version, the uh, this whole my outline and my slides that you'll be seeing up here are all on the you version. So if you want to follow along with that, that'd be great. Um, all right, good morning. We want, let's go ahead and start with prayer, and we'll, we'll get going this morning. So, Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you that even in the midst of this uh, pandemic, you are still God, and you're still on the throne, and we are still your church. So we're still going to worship you in spirit and in truth. We're going to uh, magnify you through your word. We're going to give our uh, open hearts and honest attention to the reading and teaching of your word so that you can change us and make us more like Jesus, because it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Glad you're here this morning watching. We are in week two of a series called Characters Near the Cross. Characters Near the Cross. Last week we talked about uh, Peter and his three denials, but yet the Lord gave him three chances to say, I love you and that you, I still care about you. I want you to be in my ministry. Today we're going to talk about the thief on the cross. Today's question and answer session is going to be different. Notice the phone number here is Tammy's phone number, not mine. Because my phone is doing the filming this morning, so if you have any questions about this message, about the Bible, about life in general, about Revolution Church, you can text uh, to this question right here, and Tammy and I will do a question and answer session at the end of the message. So make note of this number here, I'll show it again at the end, but go ahead and type this in your phone and get your questions ready to go, 713-408-3060. All right. So the thief on the cross, he was a blaspheming criminal, but he was converted to a believing Christian. A blaspheming criminal to a believing Christian. Um, Luke chapter 23, we're going to start at verse 26, just to give you the bigger context. There's a lot of things that happened before the thief on the cross, and we're going to kind of walk through those. Um, and I want you to uh, look at each of these like the thief on the cross would look at. In verse 26 it says, As they led him away, talking about Jesus, they seized one Simon of Cyrene. Cyrene was from Northern Africa, and this guy Simon was probably African, but he was of the Jewish faith. He was a practicing um, Hebrew, and he was going to Jerusalem as a pilgrimage for, to celebrate the Passover. And he goes there, and he gets constricted by the Roman soldiers to carry the cross, which means a whole lot because he, you, when you're getting ready to celebrate the Passover, you can't come in contact with a dead person, or a leper, or even blood. And here he's helping carry Jesus' bloody cross, so now his whole weekend plans are ruined. He can't partake in the Passover, which is why he traveled all this way, and brought his family all this way, and spent all this money. But, you know, as uh, you'll see here, I believe the Lord used this, and, it's, and uh, this is leading up to what the thief on the cross was seeing as well. It says he was coming in from, from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. Verse 27 says, And there followed him a great multitude of the people of the women who were mourning and lamenting. In Asian and Middle Eastern cultures, when, so, when, there's, when someone is dying or there's a funeral procession, there are paid mourners, the people, women who go on the streets and start crying and lamenting and wailing. And you know how in that culture they cry out loud more than we do in our Western culture. And there's... Who knows, it says a great multitude, so there's probably hundreds and hundreds, maybe even, I don't know how many, um, but sometimes when the Bible uses the word multitude, it means to refer to thousands. Now, if there's that many women in the street, that's a lot, but even then, hundreds of women are mourning and lamenting for Christ. But Jesus, turning to them, uh, but turning to them, Jesus says, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. It's interesting that Jesus is not concerned about himself, we see this all along the way to the cross, but he's concerned about these women. And here's why, because he's about to make a prophecy to them. He's saying, you think I'm suffering now, you and your children are going to suffer worse than what I'm suffering right now. He said, for behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. He says, then they will begin to say to they, the people who had babies and were nursing, they will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. And Jesus asked this question, he says, if they do these things, he's saying, look at me, I've been beaten, i got a crown of thorns on my head, I'm carrying a cross, I'm about to be crucified. If they would do all this when the wood or the tree is green, and this is a reference to himself, 
He said, if I am a live, productive tree bearing fruit, and they would do, and I'm, you know, feeding people with my produce, my fruit on my limbs. If they would do this to me, think about what they'll do to you when you are dry, you know, when things get worse, and you're not even a productive tree like I am. And so this prophecy that Jesus made right there as he's heading to his death is, was fulfilled in 70 AD. Jesus prophesied that all these things would happen, and Titus destroyed Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem and the temple of Jerusalem. In fact, Jesus said, you know what? You see this temple here? It's coming a day when not one stone will be left upon another. And of course, that's exactly what they did. They ripped the temple apart looking for gold in its foundation. Of course, they didn't find any, but Titus did destroy it and killed a lot of Jews during his time. And this was the prophecy Jesus had mentioned. And then it says in verse 32, and this is where we're getting closer to our message here, two others who were criminals. Now notice it says they were criminals. These weren't accused men. They weren't innocent men like Jesus mean. They were definitely criminals. They were guilty, deserving their punishment. They were led away to be put to death with him, with Jesus. So we got three men being crucified. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, so Jesus, where he was crucified, was sometimes called Calvary, sometimes called Golgotha in the Aramaic, and then translated the skull. Three words that basically were describing the same place. And people say, well, is that a contradiction? Well, we, what, what country do we live in? We live in America, do we live in the United States, or we live in the U.S.? Those are three phrases that all describe the same place. So there's, there's no contradiction there. The skull, though, was a place that actually looked like a skull. I'll show you a picture here in a second. And it says, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus, as always, is in the middle of everything. Here he is between the two thieves. He's in the middle of the crucifixion. He's got one thief on each side. Here's a picture of Golgotha, or the place of the skull. And as you can see, it's been by the holes in the side of this cave-like structure. You can see what is obviously like a nose and eyes and nostrils and everything like that. Um, and this is what it might have looked like at the scene of the crucifixion. So you've got Jesus in the middle, thief on either side, and the backdrop is the skull. Not a coincidence. I believe this is a reference to the first prophecy in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 says, God says when he's cursing Adam and Eve and the earth and the serpent after the fall, after sin had been introduced in, into paradise, he says, I will put enmity or hatred between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring, the offspring of the serpent, of the demonic world, and her offspring. Notice it says, her offspring. You know, usually in the Bible it refers to the seed of the man and his offspring. And you'll have um, genealogies that'll say, this guy begat so-and-so, and this guy begat so-and-so. And it'll talk about his offspring and his lineage. But here it says the offspring, and some translations say the seed of the woman. Here is a prophecy of the, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, that he will be conceived as the offspring of a woman only, not of a man. And so that referring to Jesus Christ, and there'll be hatred between the demonic world and Satan and the offspring of, of Mary, Jesus Christ. And it says, and he shall bruise your head, or could be translated skull. I think that's why this crucifixion is taking place right there at the place of the skull, because Jesus is saying, look, by me dying on this cross, I am crushing the skull or the head of the serpent. It says, and you shall bruise his heel. The serpent is going to nip Jesus on the heel and bruise it, but Jesus' heel is going to crush the skull of Satan by conquering death, by paying the ultimate price for our sins on the cross. <clears throat> In the verse 34, it says, and Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know what, not what they do, and they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. You see the mockery that's taking place here, and the total disrespect. The soldiers also mocked him, so you got the crowd, now you got the soldiers coming up and offering him sour wine, because this is in response to him saying, I thirst, and what are they offering him? Sour wine. Uh, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And this is the, one of the ironies we'll talk about here in just a minute. And there was also an inscription over him, a sign put over there that Pontius Pilate put. It says, this is the king of the Jews. And we know that from the other gospels, Matthew said that the Jews protested. No, no, don't let the sign say 
he is the king of the Jews, say that he claimed he is the king of the Jews. And Pontius Pilate just, you know, defiantly says, what I've written, I've written. Of course, what he wrote was the truth. Jesus was the king of the Jews. They just rejected their king. And um, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other thief rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Notice the, the, the attitude between the two different thieves. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. So we have this blaspheming criminal who's both the thieves at first were blaspheming Jesus. But then all of a sudden one of them wakes up and realizes, wait a minute, I'm wrong here. Jesus is right. And he goes from a blaspheming criminal to a believing Christian. This whole passage is full of so many ironies. And John MacArthur lists many of them for a while. And I'll just kind of rehearse those with you. They, they say he saved others, but he could not save himself. But the irony is he actually saved others by not saving himself. They saw him unwilling to save himself as weakness, when really that was his power of his love that, that had him cling to the cross, and therefore saving the world by not saving himself. Although in the process, he saves a thief, and he also saves a centurion, so he did save others while he was on the cross, but again, he didn't save himself from taking himself down off the cross. Another irony, they claim he is a threat to the Roman Empire. They're like, you have to crucify this guy because he's trying to overthrow Caesar, and yet he must be killed. And so then he's mocked all at the same time for saying, you can't do anything, you can't even get yourself down off the cross. So another irony there. He is accused of blasphemy by the very ones who are blaspheming him. And that's another reason he's being crucified when he's not blaspheming anybody, he's claiming to be God. He backed up the claims with his miracles. He, he will back it up with his three day, res, three day later resurrection. Another irony, he is cursed by those who hate him, but he's cursed even more by his father who loved him. Think about that. His father turned his back on him. He said, Father, you know, God, why have you forsaken me? And by Jesus being forsaken, you and I could be accepted. Another irony of the cross. He is life, and He is the giver of life, and He is giving life to those who are spiritually dead by dying for them. Another irony. The one who is life, giving life, by doing it by dying for the spiritually dead. Another irony. They want Him dead so they can go on with celebrating the Passover lamb, which doesn't ultimately remove any sins. At the same time, they're rejecting the Lamb of God, the true Passover lamb, who came to take away the sins of the world. They're like, hurry up and get Jesus down off the cross because we have to get him down before sunset because we've got to celebrate the Passover, which is God washing away our sins as the Lamb of God is washing away their sins. In fact, many people were, um, were actually slitting the throats of lambs as Jesus is, is bleeding on the cross at the exact same time. Another amazing irony. In a moment when his mind, talking about the thief, should have been fogged with the pain and chaos this thief seems to see things crystal clearly. You know, the body, when you're going through trauma like this, can go into shock, the mind can fog over, adrenaline can flow, and you can feel a numbness to all this going on, your mind stops working, and yet, when all those things should have been happening, the thief is like, wait a minute, I see what's going on here. I'm a sinner, he's the savior, and the guy gets saved. It's amazing, the irony there. Back to our text, verse 34. It says, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now your question is, who's them and who's the they? Well, keep reading let the context tell you. It says, And they, the same group they and them previously, cast lots to divide his garment. So who is casting lots for Jesus' garment? It's the Roman soldiers. Now, what was so um, intense at this time was whenever, you know how in, in American culture, if a soldier dies, we will the, the Marines or some officers will fold up the flag in a ceremony and they'll present it to the widow 
or to the, the mother of the deceased or the nearest family member. And that, that flag folded up ceremoniously is a precious thing that, the, that they look for. It's like this one last thing to remember the son by, or the husband by, or the daughter, or whoever the military service person was. And this was the equivalent to, some, to somebody's gar, inner garment. It was what was closest to them. And when, when someone died in this Hebrew culture, they would take that garment and wrap it up and they'd hand it to the mother or to the wife or someone close to the family. So here's Mary watching her son be crucified. And instead of being presented his garments, they're gambling for his garments because they don't want to cut. At first they were going to cut him in three pieces. Remember that? And, uh, but instead, and then they realized, wait a minute, this thing is woven top to bottom with no seams. Think about that. This shirt I have on has seams. It's been sewed together. But imagine weaving a garment and not patching together pieces of material, but making it from one solid woven cloth. That makes it more, much more valuable. So they didn't want to cut it up. So they say, okay, let's gamble for it and let's see who wins. And they disgrace or disrespect Jesus and his mother by doing this. And again, the thief is seeing all this. The thief is watching all this. Both thieves are, are seeing all these amazing things happen. This actually is not only an intense event, this was something that was prophesied 587 years before by King David. When King David wrote Psalm 22, he wrote, oh, there, are so, there are tons, tons of prophecies just in Psalm 22 <coughs> um, about the cross and about Jesus' crucifixion. It says, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is the same passage that says, they pierce my hands and my feet, that they pierce my side, I'm dying amongst thieves, I'm going to be in a borrowed tomb. All these prophecies happen as one passage here, and this is just one of many. Verse 35 says, and the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ or the Messiah of God, his chosen one. This is, Matthew gives a similar account that gives us a little more detail. In verse 41 says, also, So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and, he, and we will believe in him. Now, what's interesting is that's a lie. They said if he would come down from the cross, they would believe in him. But he said, In three days I'll rise again. And he did, and most of them still didn't believe him. So, you know, there's people who will argue with you about why they don't believe in God. Well, if, there's a, if God is good, why does he allow suffering? If God is, um, is, is in control, why does he allow kids to get hurt? And they have all these questions. And you know what? If you give them solid answers, they'll still say, yeah, but what about this? Yeah, but what about this? And the target keeps moving because they don't want to believe in God. I'll take that. Thanks. And they said, we will believe him, but they won't. Verse 43 says, he trusts in God. Let God deliver him if he desires or delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. And it says, and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him the same way. Now look at that verse there, phrase there in yellow. And this also is prophesied in Psalm 22. All who see me mock me, right? The crowd, the religious leaders, even the thieves, the Roman soldiers, everybody around is mocking Jesus. And they make mouths at me, and they wag their heads. You can just see them shaking their heads. Oh, you think you're Jesus. You think you're the Messiah. And he says, watch this. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Again, written almost 600 years before it happened. They're not only saying they'll gamble for my clothes, but here's the exact words that they will say. Now, how did, how did, all, how did God make all this happen? Did he tell people what to say? No, God knew the future. That's how we know the Bible is, in tr is truly the Word of God. And we know Jesus is truly the Messiah because the prophecies were fulfilled and fulfilled to the letter. Hundreds and hundreds of prophecies, over 300 some people count, that say Jesus fulfilled the prophecy to be, to be the Messiah of God. Verse 36 says, The soldiers also mocked him, mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Again, the thief is seeing this treatment of Jesus, and then seeing Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There was also an inscription, and we've already read this, so I'm just going to skip through this. But the other thief rebuked him. So both thieves at first were mocking him. 
But then something changes in one of the thieves' minds. He does a total 180, which is evidence of true salvation. He says, do, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? So let's learn some lessons from this thief. And these are lessons not only that we need to learn in order to be saved, but these are lessons, listen carefully, Christian, that you need to know to tell someone how to be saved. So you watch from both angles right here. Number one, he observes what's happening around him. And again, this may not be in your version app. I caught some mistakes here. But anyway, he observes what's happening around him. Both thieves are observing soldiers gambling for his clothes, fulfilling prophecy. Jesus for forgiving them as they do it. The prophecy being fulfilled at what people would say. How Jesus is responding to them. How Jesus is praying for them. How they both see Jesus saying, Mother, behold your son, referring to Mary and John, and John, son, behold your mother, take care of one another. He's seeing this, he's seeing on the way to the cross, women of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. This total unselfishness here. Both thieves are observing this, but one, somehow it's, he's not getting it. But this one thief, the penitent thief, is truly observing all that's going around him. And let me just say, you look at all that's going on in the world today, okay? And does this not wake you up? Does this not make you think? This is not just another pandemic, <laughs> you know? There's a, this is one of the strangest things in all of history that we've experienced. There's things that have happened in your life. You may have lost a job. Your marriage may be falling apart. Are you observing all that's going around you? Is, are you not seeing that God's trying to get your attention? And that goes for the Christians as well as those who are not sure if you're a believer yet. You need to be observant of all that's going around you like this thief was. See, he saw Jesus loving others, forgiving others, and praying for others, and it caught his attention. Number two, he feared God. He feared God. He says to the other thief, so one of the thieves says, the criminals who were hanging with him says, are you not the Christ? Okay? And this is like saying, are you not God? Are you not the Messiah? You know, if you're really God, why is all this bad stuff happening? And that really brings up the big question that people ask all the time. If God is good, then why do bad things happen? That's basically what the non-repentant thief is asking. Hey, you're the Christ. Why don't you get yourself down and get us down at the same time? If you're the Christ, why would you allow this to happen to us? <coughs> He's totally missing the point. The other thief said, hey, why are you picking on him? He hasn't done anything wrong, but we deserve what we are getting. This, this wicked thief doesn't see himself as, as deserving anything. Instead of blaming himself, saying, man, I am in this situation because I've been a murderer and a thief and a criminal, he blames God. And that, that's what people do. They, instead of saying, hey, we live in a sinful world, Adam and Eve and all of us on top have messed this world up. We're the ones who brought the curse upon the world. We're the ones who shook our fist in God's face and said, I'm gonna do, live my life my way and make my own choices. But then when bad things happen as a result of sin in a sinful world, we blame God. And that's what this thief is doing. But the other one says, do you not fear God? Implying that he does now. He fears God. Why don't you fear God like I do? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. You and I are, both deserve what we're getting. We've been condemned to die because we've killed other people. We've stolen things. We've been causing an insurrection. And yet we deserve all of this. So he feared God because he understood that he was in danger of God's judgment. You see, he was seeing past the, what his dying circumstances. He didn't fear God because look at me, oh man, I'm dying. He knows because I'm dying, I'm going to face a holy God. I'm going to face a God who's going to judge me for all the wicked things I've done. And so therefore, I need to fear this God. Matthew gives us another perspective that Luke uh, sees differently, not a contradiction, but just different perspective. Verse 28 says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Don't be afraid of these Roman soldiers, okay? Don't be afraid of people who can shoot you, poison you, take your life, hang you, okay? But rather, you need to fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And some people read that and say, it's Satan. No, that's not at all. It's God. You see, a human being can kill your body. But only God can take your soul and your body and cast it into hell. And that's who you need to fear. And this isn't, you know, popular feel-good preaching, but this is what the Bible clearly says, that we are to fear God because He is a holy, righteous judge and He must pardon, He must judge sin. He, in His love, He wants to pardon sin, but in His holiness, He needs to judge sin. We'll talk more about that in a bit. 
Romans 3.18 says that there's no, talking about humanity as a whole, when it says there's none righteous, no, not one. In the same context, it says there is no fear of God before their eyes. There's people who will, you know, do things knowing that God is watching, knowing that others are watching, they don't care. There's no fear of God. But this is really all of us when we make our rebellious choices. Lesson number three, he accepts the guilt and punishment of his own sins. He accepts the guilt and the punishment of his own sins. He says, we, including himself in this, indeed are being punished justly. For we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. He, he realizes he's guilty. He's not asking for an exception. He's not ask, asking to be taken off the cross. He realizes he deserves what it, and he, therefore he makes him fear God. You see, <clears throat> most world religions have a totally false concept of how you get to heaven. Muslims, Jews, most Christians, Buddhists, they believe that there's this scale that God uses that if your right deeds outweigh your wrong deeds, that God's will say, okay, I'll let you into heaven. It's not nowhere in the Bible. It is nowhere in the Bible. In fact, think about how flawed that thinking is. Let's say we use that same mentality on a human judge here in the state of Texas. Let's say that you rob a bank and you did it and you maybe even you shot somebody in the process. So now it's a felony and you stand before the judge and you tell the judge, hey, one day I was just really not making good decisions. And yes, I did rob the bank. That was one day, one event, one bad deed or maybe a few bad deeds. But up until that point, I had been going to the homeless shelter, feeding the homeless, donating money, volunteering, helping my neighbor. In fact, there was even a neighbor down the street who was a widow, and I mowed her lawn every Saturday that summer. I did a lot of good stuff. Certainly that good outweighs this one day of bad events. <laughs> that judge is going to look you in the eye and say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You want me to let you go, the person you shot, and put in the hospital and rob in that bank. You want to let all that go because you've done all these good deeds. It doesn't work that way. If a judge did that, he would be removed from his court. He would be laughed. He'd be, he'd be on the front pages of the newspapers, on the news and everywhere, saying this corrupt judge let this criminal go because of a bunch of good deeds. You know, it doesn't work that way for a human judge and by, by any standard, it does not work that way before a divine judge. The problem is, you've done bad deeds, what has to happen with those? The punishment has to be paid. And then Steve knows that he deserves this, but he also sees that Jesus is the one paying the price for him. So not only does he recognize his own sin and guilt, but he also recognizes the perfection of Jesus. The perfection of Jesus. He says, we indeed justly, and this is our due reward, but this man has done nothing wrong. He doesn't say he hasn't done as much wrong as we have, or he's not guilty of this one crime he's being crucified for. He's saying this guy is perfect. He's never done anything ever wrong. He's done nothing wrong. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the world's trespasses against them, and for our sake, in verse 21, He, God, made Him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus never experienced sin Himself, but He became sin for us. He took upon all our sins so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Number five. <clears throat> He sees his greatest need is his eternal salvation. His need is not, get me down off this cross, or please take, do something to take away the pain. But he, Jesus, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He doesn't ask that he might live. Sorry about that. Sorry to feel dizzy. He doesn't ask that he might live, doesn't ask to feel no pain, or that, he, that he would explain why. He doesn't, doesn't ask that he would explain how, why he allows suffering. And he accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Verse 42 says, And Jesus says, He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into the kingdom. He said, Jesus, remember me when you enter into the kingdom. Jesus, he's calling Jesus by his name, which means Yeshua. Um, 
God, his name literally means God is our salvation. He said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom, you recognize Jesus as the king. Not only is he the savior, he's the king. He believes in the resurrection. He says, when you come in your kingdom, he knew Jesus would live past all this. Here Jesus is dying, he's dying, but he knows Jesus will come into his kingdom. And then he's given assurance of salvation by Jesus. He says, truly, now get this, amazingly, I'm saying you, listen carefully, today you'll be with me in paradise. Not after you go through some time in purgatory, or not if you live a good enough life, because there's no time for that, but today you'll be with me in paradise. 1 John 5.13 says, I read, write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You know, most religions, you ask them, are you going to go to heaven when you die? And they'll say, I hope so. The Bible says that you can know so. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? This blasphemy criminal did, and he became a believing Christian. There's Jesus in the middle of all this. Dying on the cross for you and for me. Excuse me. Romans 5 eight says, God demonstrates or shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All right. Um, thank you for the Gatorade or power. I'm feeling better. If you have questions, you can text them now to 713-408-3060. But let me pray for us, okay? Um, Father, thank you. thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus dying, not only for the thief, thieves on the cross, but for us who are also guilty who also deserve to die. Lord, I pray that um, we would, if there's someone here who doesn't know Christ as Savior, that they would be like the thief who opened up his eyes and saw what was going around them and accepted as Savior. Lord, I pray that we would uh, just have the courage to believe what God is doing and that Jesus saves. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. <sighs> I've been taking an antibiotic, and I think that's what's happening is it's messing with me right now. So, um, any questions that have been sent in there? Yes, I have a question. Uh, this week it was reported that David Jeremiah said that the coronavirus is probably not a sign of the end times. According to scripture, I do believe it is part of the birth pains Jesus talked about. Can you offer your thoughts? Yeah, um, H1N1, which hit our country and the world about six years ago, it killed 60 million people. And I'm not sure if we're underreacting, we underreacted then or we're overreacting now. So pandemics have happened. For some reason, this one is taken more seriously. I don't know why, I'm not questioning. I think those in the government know what they're doing. Um, but there's more people being killed from car accidents and other things like that, even heart disease on a daily basis that are being killed by this. So I don't think, just because the media is making a bigger deal of it than, than other ones, I'm not saying more than they should, but other ones, there's been pandemics happening all throughout history. If you study the bubonic plague, the, the Spanish flu, the black plague, all throughout history, in fact, at one point in Europe, uh, in the, the Dark Ages, one out of every three people died in Europe. Think about that, in the plagues. So. Um, and they didn't think Christ was coming then, or at least if they did, they weren't accurate. So, I do think it's birth bangs, and you may see the frequency increase, but I wouldn't just say, hey, this is it, because when Christians do that, then 15 years from now, I'll say, yeah, the Christians said that was it, and they all said Y2K was it, and then they said uh, Osama bin Laden was it, and they just, you don't want to read too much into it. Is it more evidence? Yes. Is it the evidence? Probably not. Good question. That was all I had. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Um, let me, uh, if, and you have to send your questions to this number here because we can't get them via the Facebook stream right now. I can answer the Facebook questions later. All right. Um, if you trust in Christ your Savior today, I would love to know that. This is my cell phone number right there on the screen. Am I annoyed? No. Um, Go ahead and text me. Uh, you can text me any questions about Revolution Church as well. There. Do you need to know someone who needs to hear this next week's series about characters of the cross? Please pray for them and invite them to join you next week. 
And um, let me just do some quick announcements here. So to continue to follow the government's guidelines, you know, we, we're commanded to be submissive to government authorities. And so that's why we didn't have a praise ban this week. Hopefully things will change on that. Um, so we are going to have some Zoom conferences. If you can see these here, and they're on this, this slide uh, that's been sent out in version. Tomorrow night, 8 p.m., I'm going to send out a link tomorrow day. You can join me for a Zoom conference. And just pick one of these, maybe two, but it's going to be the same thing each time as far as what we're studying and talking about. Tuesday morning, I'll do one early at 8.30 in the morning. For those who want to get up early, do that. Wednesday is at 2 o'clock. Uh, for anybody who wants to join us then, especially if you have kids who take a nap. Uh, Wednesday is at 7.15. That will be Lauren and Patty's one. And Lauren will be leading that. And then I'll do Thursday one, uh, 11 a.m., like mid-morning there. So uh, I'll continue to also do some Facebook live streams throughout the week. Um, thanks to Tammy and the kids helping me with the other one. It's still on the Facebook uh, page if you want to watch that. Um, and again, I encourage you to, to download the U version if you haven't already. And it's not too late to read the, the reading plan for Easter and get caught up on that. It's been an excellent reading plan. It's been good to see you all watch uh, and what the Lord is doing through that and the comments you're making. Um, if, you're not if you want to receive daily texts from the church with prayer requests and updates and links to these things, uh, just text the word REVOLUTION to 84576. The word REVOLUTION to 84576. Or you can visit flocknote, flocknote.com forward slash REVOLUTION to get these daily texts. Let me also encourage you to pray for our missionaries, uh, the Casey's in Spain, the Joneses in, based out of Lebanon, and the Nyanus in Ghana, West Africa, as well as other missionaries and what God's doing. Here's what I want you to do. Um, I want you to look up this song on YouTube, How Deep the Father's Love, by Austin Stone Worship. And I'm actually, I'll send you a link as soon as we end this video, uh, in case you don't find it. And I want you to let that be your worship song for this morning. And play that together as a family or in whatever small group you're in right now, okay? All right, well, God bless you. You have a great week, and I'll send a link to this song here in just a second. His wounds have paid my rent.